thank you. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. And please uh, give me a 10 minutes warning before I'm supposed to end so I can know where I'm standing. Um, uh, <clears throat> the title of my presentation is some kind of a comparison between two Supreme Court judgments that were rendered by the Israeli Supreme Court. And what I will be doing is I would be presenting each of these two cases. Um, I would be very critical in terms of the holding in each of these cases. Um, then I would try to offer my own explanation why the resolution in each of these two cases uh, makes sense. And then I would recap uh, by indulging with uh, group rights, multiculturalism, and bringing in a kind of an unintuitive argument whereby group rights at times can make more sense than liberalism. Uh, against the current tide where we are kind of moving from group rights to liberal rights, but I would be trying to make uh, an opposite uh, argument. So this is the skeleton of what I would be presenting, so at least you can know where I will be heading uh, onwards. The first case is Muna Jabarin of Nazareth. It's a case dealing with a Muslim a student from Umm al-Fahim who saw admission at a prestigious Catholic school in Nazareth by the name of Al-Mutran, the bishop. Um, it's a very well-known school, very hard to get in. And Muna Jabarin was a Muslim student uh, seeking admission to this school and being able to travel from Umm al-Fahim to Nazareth on a daily basis, about a half an hour best drive each way, and saw admission to this school. She passed the admissions exams. She was perceived as being qualified to attend the school. Uh, and when she came in for some enrichment classes in August, just a month before the school started, uh, she came in with her headscarf. She became a religious Muslim uh, practicing, practicing Islam and according to what she perceived to be the dictate of her religion, uh, the headscarf was how she is to display herself in public. And once she came to the school, uh, the school headmaster said, well, you cannot be admitted. You cannot attend the school as long as you are with your headscarf. This is a Catholic school, uh, and we have our own dress code, and according to our dress code, you cannot come in with the headscarf. Uh, Muna Jabarin then petitioned the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, bringing in a petition saying, this is an infringement on my right of freedom of conscience. I have the right to practice my religion. Part of my religion is coming in with my headscarf. The school is infringing on this right, and therefore, please make the school abide by the norm, the public norm, that respects my freedom of conscience. And so she petitioned the Supreme Court on the basis of her freedom of conscience. Her petition was rejected. The holding of the Israeli Supreme Court accepted the position offered by the school. According to that position, we have a dress code, we have an interest in commonality among our students, and Justice Barak then, then to become the president of the Israeli Supreme Court, brought in pluralism. Uh, because the school is a host or is a venue of people coming from different religions, from different strands within Christianity, not only Catholics. Uh, it has an interest in a commonality, uh, to stress the common experience. Uh, we might have physical education classes, and there was also an objection on part of Muna Jabarin. I cannot participate in a swimming class, at least when the swimming class is with male students. I would not be able to wear my 
uh, or a shorts to my sports class. I would need to come with a training. Uh, so she had also objections on these terms. And the school was saying, and it was uh, affirmed uh, by the Israeli Supreme Court, that the, the school has an interest in its dress code of communality and pluralism. In the name of pluralism, uh, it seeks to host all of these different breeds of students, and therefore uh, you cannot come stressing your own dress code, uh, which is the headscarf in this case. That was the Mona Jabarin case. Uh, when I started reading the Mona Jabarin case, I, I really became very puzzled. Uh, the first puzzling fact, this is Israel's headscarf case. It made no headlines. I only found two scholarly articles, uh, by the way, referring uh, to this Mona Jabarin case. And they take the political context. I mean, an Israeli Supreme Court restricting the Muslim headscarf. This is dynamite. This is explosive stuff. But nonetheless, no headlines. It was barely discussed in the Arabic uh, press. The Jewish press did not pick it up at all. The scholarly literature, I just, as I said, two scholarly articles dealing with the case, nothing, compared with what is happening in Europe. Tons of scholarly articles, books. Each month there's a book out about the headscarf, about the niqab, about the veil in Europe. Um, and it, it is making headlines. And it's in the press always. Um, the, pra the, the French case, is, is very exemplary in terms of how it was dominating uh, the public discussion. In Germany, it also made headlines when a Muslim teacher came in in, in Bavaria wanting to have her head scarf but was prevented. And I was asking myself, why is this silence in Israel? How could it be? When anything dealing with anything with an Arab school, with an Arab community, is, is really uh, very dominating in, in the press, and an Israeli Supreme Court restricting the Muslim headscarf, making no headlines, nothing. And then I beca be began to be <coughs> interested in, the, in, in Barak's holding. Is this pluralism? Is pluralism about commonality or is it about difference? I checked the literature on pluralism. The first thing about pluralism is that I respect your difference. That's the first step when you take on lib pluralism as a normative theory, is not to stress the commonality, not to stress what we have in common, but to stress what we have indifference. It's about diversity, it's about respecting diversity, and then pluralism comes back to what extent I should respect. But as an initial step in pluralism, as a theory, it's about respecting the difference, not about making the difference disappear. So this was kind of also a, a very, I think, a loose argument on behalf of the Israeli Supreme Court, and it didn't make sense to me. The other fact has to do with Al Mutran, uh, the school itself. I don't know if we have students here from Nazareth, but who's the headmaster of the Al Mutran school? A Catholic priest. And how do you suspect a Catholic priest would come into school? In a civilian? dress, or he would put on his robe and come in with his religious wardrobe. It's with his religious wardrobe. There are religious prayer taking place in a Catholic school like all other Catholic schools. How would you suspect that the nuns at the school would come in? They would not come in in a civilian dress code. They would come in with their religious 
dress code. And what about a Christian student who has the cross on? Would that be restricted in the name of commonality? So what's this talk about commonality when it was known and it was apparent even to the court because the court itself admitted in the judgment that the school itself serves for the education and the training of future Catholic priests. Is that about commonality? How can you speak about commonality and pluralism when the school acts like I've just said it is acting? More so if we take the German case with the headscarf. The first that were targeted in terms of restricting the headscarf was the staff of the school and not the students. So German students can, can come in to the school if they happen to be Muslim with their headscarf. But if there's a restriction, the first to be targeted in terms of the restriction is the staff in the name of commonality. Because if you have a commonality as an ideal, you would think that it should apply first to the school administration. But in the Israeli case, it was the opposite. It was the other way around. It, it applies to the students, where it was very much known that the staff of the school can still come in with their Christian wardrobe. So the case did not make sense at all to me. And then came Another uh, Supreme Court judgment, it's Noar Kahalacha. It's an intra-Jewish conflict. And this case of Noar Kahalacha dealt with a ultra-Orthodox school in a settlement in the occupied West Bank of Emmanuel. Uh, this settlement began having some new population converts people that were not that much strict in terms of Jewish religious practices. And this kind of triggered an intra-conflict in that settlement whereby the more ultra-Orthodox, the more conservative, sought to establish their own school for girls. And at the end, the existing school in Emmanuel for ultra-Orthodox schools was split into two. You had one section of the school dominated by the Ashkenazi uh, ultra-Orthodox group, and the other section was for all others, mainly the Sfaradi uh, Jewish ultra-Orthodox population. In terms of the statistics, there were a mirror image of about 73% uh, of one group in one section and 27% uh, in the other section. That was in the Ashkenazi uh, section. In the Sfaradi section, it was predominantly Sfaradi, uh, with almost no Ashkenazi uh, presence of ultra-Orthodox school. And a petition was filed before the Israeli Supreme Court saying this is discrimination, this separation of the school, which was initiated by the Ashkenazi faction. This is discrimination, ethnic dis discrimination against the Sfaradi girls. And at the end, the petition was accepted. And the Supreme Court ruled against the separation. Uh, now, be mindful of the fact that it was stated in the court decision itself that any Sfaradi student that was ready to abide by the by rules of the Ashkenazi section would be admitted to that section. And that's why you have 27% of that section being Sfaradi in terms of its student population. The internal by rules also dictated at first that the prayer would be in an Ashkenazi uh, accent, Havara um, Ashkenazit. The by rules also dictated that these girls that are admitted cannot connect to the internet. 
they cannot host in their private homes people that do not respect the Jewish halakha and the mitzvot. They cannot ride on bicycles in public. Uh, and they cannot listen to the radio or see the TV. And the Supreme Court came out saying, this is the Israeli Brown case. Segregation is against equality. Separate cannot be equal. And Brown is uh, explicitly cited by the justices in the Israeli Supreme Court. Separate cannot be equal. Your separateness is inequality. And it's indignifying because you have this Ashkenazi section have segregated the Sephardi uh, students uh, implicitly if not explicitly. And therefore, uh, the petition was uh, accepted and the Supreme Court ordered that the two, the, the, the Ministry of, of, of Education work to uni unify uh, both sections or dismantle the separation between the two sections of the school. And then this was also very puzzling to me. Well, let's compare the two cases. Why is a Catholic school saying no to a Muslim student? That's okay. But when an Ashkenazi section is saying no to a Sephardi section, that's not okay. Why is a Catholic school trying to separate itself? That being something which is legitimate. But when the Ashkenazis want to separate themselves, that's illegitimate. But then the court relied heavily also in the Noar Kahalakha on liberalism. You cannot pursue equality as a legal principle when you are seeking separation. And therefore, Brown came in and it was cited. But that's puzzling. What's liberalism with a girl? not being able, able to connect with, to the internet. Is that liberalism? Preventing these girls to connect to the web. Is that liberal when these girls are unable to see people from other cultures? They cannot host in their home people that do not abide by the halakha. Is that liberalism? Is liberalism about preventing the girls' students from riding on the bicycle? How can that be liberal? Now, when I bring this case to my students, my paradigm is a kind of a cult of some wacko that was in wacko, Texas at <laughs> once. But Goel Ratzon, yeah, he's, a, he's an Israeli cult. Uh, uh, personality who had about over 20 wives, uh, not officially his wives, but living and having tens of children. He w was prosecuted and indicted, and now he is in jail. But let's say that Goel Ratzon accepts only Jewish women to his cult. <laughs> An Arab woman comes to apply or a Sephardi woman comes to apply, no, I'm just Ashkenazi. I don't accept. And this woman would file a claim to the court saying, you're being unequal. You're separating yourself. And I, in the name of liberalism, I ask to be a member. Would liberalism stand on the side of this Arab woman who wants to become a member of his cult? And I think this is the paradigm of Noar Kahalakha. Liberalism was protecting these Faradi girls to become a member of a much more conservative, ultra-Orthodox society. If you want to take a more realistic case, for those of you who know the American legal culture, let's take the case of Yoder and Wisconsin. Yoder is the case of the Amish, 
who on the basis of their freedom of conscience came up saying we want to take our children out of school at the age of 14 instead of the age of 16, which was the compulsory uh, education law in Wisconsin. And these four parents were tried, indicted, and they were acquitted on the basis of their freedom of conscience in the, in the, in the US Supreme Court. Now let's take the case of a non-Amish Muslim Jew who finds the claim, I want to be a member of this Amish society. This is the paradigm of Noar Kohalakha. Does liberalism support a claim of a non-member to become a member because the people who are saw are discriminating against the non-member on the basis of his or her ethnicity, religion, or whatever. So the case did not make sense to me. No halakha. How can liberalism be on the side of these Faradi girls? But the result felt just, and I think it's ultimately just. And this brought me to kind of reconsider both of these holdings, uh, trying to offer something in alternative, or something in place of what the court was saying. And this brought me to group rights and communitarianism as a legal theory instead of liberalism. There is something in group rights, an intuition, right? And I would display it without much theory which is very simple. Uh, let's take the US reality in the 1960s and segregation, uh, it was pronounced to be illegal back in 1954, I guess. Uh, when segregation was in place in the US, it was deemed to be unjust and it was right to be unjust because who was segregating who? It was the whites saying to the blacks, I don't want you in my schools. I'm segregating you. I'm determining the segregation. But when a minority seeks the segregation, when the minority is seeking to be different, and it is seeking the exclusion, then it becomes more legitimate in terms of group right theory. So if the black community, for instance, in the US is seeking to have its own schools because it has its own culture and it wants to indoctrinate its own children, that is perceived to be more legitimate. Look at the Amish. It is they that who are seeking the segregation. But when they are segregated by the majority, then that becomes something problematic in terms of legal theory. Take the Ethiopian Jews in Petah Tigva in Israel who are pushed out of the public schools uh, by the local community. That's local Israeli segregation that is taking place, right? The, Mano the Emmanuel case did not end by the merging of the two schools. They're still separate. But Let's assume that the Ethiopian Jews are seeking to be different. They're not pushed out by the majority. They are seeking to be autonomous in their educational system. Then that is considered to be more legitimate, normatively. So basically, in, in terms of group rights theory, it is really a very important notion, basic notion, an axiom, if you want, which says it depends who is telling who that I want to be different. If it's the majority pushing for the exclusion, this, is, this tends to be much more improper than when a minority is pushing for the exclusion in terms of group rights. I can go into theory, but I don't have much time. And this also explains why the two cases do make sense in terms of their final resolution. In Muna Jabarin, it was a minority, the Catholic 
Christian community trying to preserve its own identity. And when that is done, it's considered to be legitimate. The difficulty in Muna Jabarin that it was trying to assert its own identity against another minority, not necessarily against the majority. But still, there can be a claim when the minority is seeking to preserve its own identity. But if we take Muna Jabarin and have her apply to Bar Ilan University, which is also <coughs> religious, and Bar Ilan is restricting her admission on her taking off the veil, it would be less legitimate because this is a majority group that is restricting. But in Al Mutran, it's a minority group that is making the restriction and it becomes much more legitimate. In Noar Kahalakha, Sami Samuha is here. Uh, it is well known that the Sephardis were discriminated against all throughout the history of Israel by the Ashkenazi establishment, also within the ultra-Orthodox community. And that discrimination is essentially what is at play in Noar Kahalakha. It was the Ashkenazis telling the Sephardics, we want to be different. It wasn't the Sephardi saying that we want to be different. And when that was said, it was considered to be legitimate in Israeli educational system. Because the Sephardic community, Shas, built itself on Ma'ayan Ha'inu Haturani. A Sephardic, ultra Orthodox educational stream. When that happened, when that took place, that is legitimate because it's the unprivileged minority seeking to preserve its culture. But in Emmanuel, it was the Ashkenazis telling the Sephardics, we want to be different. And that's why it was indignifying. That's why it was considered to be an illegitimate. Now to recap. In group rights, there are three major problems that are dealt with uh, <clears throat> in terms of people dealing with group rights and multiculturalism. One, it's the problem of the minority within the minority. When you accommodate a group, you are destined to undermine the rights of weak or vulnerable members within that group. When you accommodate the Christians in Israel by granting them autonomy in their personal status affair, and the Christian community does not have a, a divorce, right? there is no divorce or limited divorce, then especially women within that community are, uh, are, are more restricted in terms of how they can lead their private life. I can be a Christian man, I can lead whatever life I'd like. Nobody's gonna be that harsh on me. But a woman who is married and still married and she happens to be a woman and she cannot get a divorce, she cannot have the same freedom. If I happen to be a Muslim and I be under the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts, I cannot marry as a woman more than one man, but my husband can marry up to four women. If I happen to be a Druze woman, I can be unilaterally divorced uh, by my husband, but I cannot do the same. So there is this problem of accommodating a religious group or any group that happens to be patriarchal, and then you would undermine the rights of women and children within. And therefore, multiculturalism has a big problem dealing with this minority within minority problem. And the talk is, well, we have to be liberal. We should see the interests of the individual even if these interests go against the interest of the group. And so liberalism is kind of prescribed as a normative, uh, uh, outlook that would provide some comfort or some resolution. The other problem with group rights is about essentialism. We talk about Muslims, Christians, and there's a tendency when we talk about groups to essentialize the group. This group becomes like stereotyped. They act in a certain way. Uh, all Muslims are as such, or Christians are as such. There's a problem of essentialism. 
it was kind of depicted in one of the articles, right? Especially in terms of Oriental cultures. Right? Uh, two women came into a workplace in Canada. Uh, the white woman came in with the headscarf, and she was welcomed by her peers, saying, "Well, a nice fashion, a nice model. Well, the, it looks nice on you." No, she said, "I've I've I've become a Muslim." Ah, oh, you become a Muslim. Wow, we didn't know that. We suspected it was a fashion. And then a, a dark-skinned Oriental woman comes into the same workplace, and she comes in with the headscarf. Ah, oh, you've become a Muslim. How nice. No, she, had, she said, I had a bad haircut, so I needed to cover my hair. <laughs> this is very typical when we deal with groups and we identify groups with certain cultures and norms. Uh, we essentialize the group, right? Uh, honor killing, right? When it's an oriental man killing his wife, it's honor. But if it happens just the same in the West, no, this is a crime of passion. It's a basic human instinct. It's not a matter of honor. So there's a problem of essentialism when we deal with cultures and group rights. The third problem, and therefore liberalism would come in and say, well, human reality is much more, um, much more st differently structured than this essentialism. It's, it's, it's more, uh, how would you say, it's more complicated. You cannot treat all people like you think they happen to be. The third problem with group rights happens to deal with affirmative action. Uh, it's a big topic now in American jurisprudence. Should the African American community be preferred when seeking admission to a law school or to a medical school? Uh, a lot of discussion in the Supreme Court, the conservative side would eventually, I think, deem affirmative action to be against the equal treatment, equality as a principle. And there is a problem with affirmative action. I happen to be a white American who's, in terms of my credentials, they go much over my friend who happens to be black. I do not get the admission to the medical school in California, right? but he does. It's, it's a problem in terms of equality. And therefore, we have to deal with the principle of affirmative action. And the, the, the answer, once again, is let's, let's be liberal. Let's be concerned with the individual. But what I've tried to do just now is to try to offer you something that also exists, is that liberalism, when applied, does not make a lot of sense. And these are the cases of Muna Jabarin and Noar Kahalakha. The court sought a liberal outlook. That was the, core, the course of the court in terms of reasoning its holding. But I have, if I was convincing, I think, or at least I tried, I think I just showed that this liberal outlook does not make any sense. What makes sense of both of these cases is only the group right outlooks. So for those in group rights theory that think that maybe liberalism is the answer, I think I'm trying to push a bit against that trend, saying that maybe the two are inseparable. Thank you. We have now time for, um, we need to answer the questions, um, but Mikhail has to go, so that's okay. I have 10 minutes. That's has nothing to do with collective rights, it has to do with the legitimacy of Jewish ethnicity in Israel vis-a-vis -vis religion. Jewish ethnicity in Israel is Jewish, Jewish, legit, Jewish ethnicity in Israel is illegitimate. And you have to understand it. Zionism is based on the idea of negation of the diaspora. So the difference between Ishkenazi and Sephardic Jews is not legitimate. Ma'anachinu Khaturani is not ethnicity. 
It is, it is religion. This is religion. So you don't, you don't know it is, it is primarily ultra-Orthodox. And it gets this. Now, if Ethiopian Jews want to have, to have a separate school, they will not get it. They will not get it by no means. If Russian Jews in Israel, it's, a, it's more serious, if they would like to establish... They have an all Ethiopian school in Rehovot. Yeah, that's, that is a practice. I'm talking about if they, Russian Jews, this is much more serious. Suppose a Russian Jews in Israel would like to establish a Russian schools in, 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 uh, in uh, Russian language. No way, no way they will get it. Uh, no collective rights to Jews in Israel by ethnicity. You have a Russian channel on TV. You have a Russian radio. This is a transitional situation. That's the way to facilitate their absorption and the disappearance of their ethnicity. Now, on the question of religion, religion, it's legitimate. So if the Catholic school want to preserve its Catholic appearance, the public, don't, of course they have this. You know, has nothing to do, you can connect it with collective rights. Jews in Israel, on the basis of ethnicity, they have no collective rights. The only, dis uh, the only deviation is the, uh, the, the, uh, the rabbinical, uh, uh, the uh, Rabbanut Rashid, the chief rabbinate. But still, most Jews in Israel, they don't see this as legitimate. And they want to do away with this because it's historical leg le uh, legacy. That's what, uh, so I'm giving you okay. a different, co a different explanation of this two court and has nothing to do uh, even if a minority in Israel, a Jewish minority, want to have separate ethnicity, they will not give it to, to them. Has nothing to do with liberalism here. It has to do with the, the, the role of religion in this country vis-a-vis -vis Jewish ethnicity in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you want to Let's take all the questions. Oh, uh, yes. Well, other people with questions. Yes, Ona. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, my question, just a bit of clarification, really. So my understanding is that there's different public streams of education for different groups. But in terms of the Mutran, this is a private school. It doesn't actually yeah. correspond to the same public stream. So I'm wondering if that makes a difference to your analysis. Um, that's all I want to ask. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Somebody else raised this hand at the back, please. I'm sorry, I cannot, I don't have, you, it's you, it's you, yes. Okay. But I don't have the microphone for you. Can you raise your voice? Yes, I'm wondering, how do you determine the scope of a minority? You're saying that the Mizrahi girls are a minority, but if you look at Israeli society as a whole, Ashkenazi religious, yeah. ultra-Orthodox Jews might be a, a minority of all the Jews. So how do you determine the scope of what is protected? Sephardi, not Mizrahi, you... Sephardi! Sephardi! <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Uh, the opportunity another one questions and that's it if not michael go ahead because you need to run i'm sorry but he has to run yeah. well thank you for the questions i think uh, we have a big discussion sammy i think uh, it is right that you had a melting pot a kind of a policy in terms of the israeli establishment but this was back in the 1960s 1970s I read Israeli society today as being much more accommodating to the different ethnicities uh, in terms of the Russians, in terms of within the Sfaradi and the, and the Ashkenazi. Uh, I think the, the melting pot uh, policy of the ingathering of the exiles, right, is, is some kind of going downhill. It's not going uphill. It's, it's the Jewish community, I read it, as becoming more, but nonetheless, this this does not negate what I offered here. Uh, I think my axiom still works well in terms of how you determine the relationship between the interactions of groups. There is one legitimate cause that can be for a minority for segregating itself, and a minority in terms of the power structure. That's how I deem a minority. It's in terms of the power structure. Who who determines? Who, who, who has the final word? Who's, who's in government more? And re historically, 
it was the Ashkenazis, even though the numbers now might might be different. So it's it's like a f comparable to the men and women in society. Women are maybe even more than men in terms of the society, but this still does not make the society being more pro woman than men. It's still very against uh, or for or works for discriminating women in terms of the numbers. So the numbers is not is not what what determines a minority majority right. relationship. Well, still, still, there is a very interesting dynamics within the ultra-Orthodox community. I didn't go into it, but you remember that they, you had a quota system in the U.S. for Jews being admitted to prestigious law schools, to Harvard or to Yale in the 1920s, right? You had a quota system. And nonetheless, the Jews wanted to be admitted. And there's something similar going on among the ultra-Orthodox uh, Sephardi who seek admission to these prestigious Ashkenazi yeshivot, even though each of these yeshivot would have a quota. Not more than 20% can be Sephardic, the prestigious. This is in existence in Israel. So I don't think that there is this sense of being one collective. I, I, I read Israeli society much much more differently from, from Sami Samoha. In terms of the private-public divide, it's a very important thing. But take into consideration that Al-Mutran school is characterized by the Israeli Ministry of Education as being Mukar Lorishmi, recognized but unofficial, unofficial but recognized, which deems it eligible to receive 80% of its budget from the Ministry of Education. Its curriculum is supervised by the Ministry of Education, the teachers who are appointed need to get approval uh, from the Ministry of Education. There is a supervisor working on behalf of the Ministry of Education coming into the school and supervising the activities of that school. And so I think it's, it's, it's much more public than private. Uh, and that's why I regard it to be anomalous in the sense that, yeah, well, there would be more freedom. Uh, I cannot go into that, but the American, I mean, the more the institution is private, the more we are willing to have that institution discriminate against non-members, especially in the U.S., right? The anti-discrimination norm in the U.S. does not apply to religious institutions. It does not apply. So there is this tendency, and why? Because religion is, is tended to be, or has this very powerful ingredient of being very private. Uh, and therefore, we, we do not want to handle. Um, so so that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, now we have, um, thank you very much for your answers. Uh, uh,